All right. That's for you, Mom. Okay. Um, so, and I apologize, too, if it seems a little uh, impersonal and uh, sterile for me to have this uh, projected thing here. Um, I'm used to giving uh, technical talks to other people, and we always have some sort of a visual thing going on. And, and for me to just stand and, and speak and um, trust that you're all listening to what I say attentively, that's uh, kind of difficult for me to manage. So this may be more for me than for you, although I'm going to have some nice pictures to look at. So um, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, there is a, you can see a little, little page counter down in the corner. I don't know if you, you people probably can't, but so you know when it's going to be over. If I see people here, that's, I know why. Okay, uh, so I, I am a, a mathematician. I'm not a theologian, and I don't typically, like I said, I don't, I don't often do uh, presentations like this. Um, so it was a little, uh, you know, uh, I, I had this in my mind uh, all the time when I was preparing. Here's a little list of words which were used last week, which I will not be using tonight. <laughs> Ontological. I know what most of these words mean. I'm just not going to use them. Kantianism. Meta-ethical. Hermeneutical. Normative. Xanological. De jure. Um, actually, nobody said hermeneutical. <laughs> and that is not a real word. But, um, I, what am I going to talk about? So uh, at least one person in uh, asking me about this event said, oh, you're not going to talk about math, are you? Um, and I was careful not to include the word mathematics in the title of the talk, which is why you all still came, I think. Um, math is, it, it is what I'm an expert about. So if someone asks me to talk about something, um, I feel like I should say at least something about that. And actually, um, my understanding of mathematics is, is one of the sort of key things that, um, the key ways in which I experience my faith. And so for me to give a talk at all about my faith, um, to me that, that, that is really a deep part of it. And so uh, hopefully I can give you kind of a flavor of that. I don't expect to turn you all into mathematical enthusiasts, but, um, but at least, uh, you know, that is something that uh, I want to share with people if I'm going to be genuine about, about myself. So let's talk about... Uh, Actually, I, I'm not terribly good with numbers. And what's interesting about this number? Any ideas? There's nothing, actually. I just, that's a random, I just mashed the keys. Um, so uh, if I do talk about mathematics, it's, I'm, not, I'm not really going to talk about uh, numbers. Um, what I'm interested as far as math goes is beautiful ideas, discovering them, creating them, thinking them, describing them. I think uh, I, this may seem kind of... Um, I don't know, a little, a little lofty, uh, but really this is sort of what intrigues me about mathematics, is about beautiful ideas, discovering them, creating them, thinking them, describing them. I think mathematics in that sense is kind of the deepest level of God's creation that we can actually access. In a, in a sense, it's a little deeper than, say, studying the world around us because um, Mathematics could still exist even if the world around us was drastically different. There are still mathematical truths are, uh, in a sense, deeper truths than, say, truths from physics or the, the, uh, the sciences. Um, and I think it's a worthwhile thing to study beautiful ideas and beauty in general, especially if those beautiful ideas come from God's creation. Um, the practice of discovering beautiful ideas of God's creation and thinking about them and describing them to other people. This is really what in other contexts we call worship and evangelism. Uh, so I think in this sense, uh, this is a good enough pursuit for me. I feel like this is, it's a worthy thing to, uh, to think about. Um, and that is, uh, you know, I don't, every day when I go to work, I don't think about, I don't feel like I'm sort of exploring God's creation in deep and wonderful ways. That's not something that's easy to, to think about all the time, just like uh, anybody else doing their job. But um, it is really what's important to me. Uh, anyway, I want to start off talking about creation and discovery. Actually, I said uh, over there I, that I like discovering and creating beautiful ideas. Um, 
here's a little, I just made up some definitions here because I want to talk about creation and discovery. Creation is about making things which did not exist before, and discovery is about revealing and describing pre-existing truths, that is, things that already did exist before. Uh, I, I don't know if you agree with these definitions, but let's just say that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, they seem like different concepts, but a big idea that I want to talk about for the next few minutes at least is that creation and discovery, I think, are on a spectrum. Um, I think really at, at a certain level they are not two different activities. They are kind of the same thing. Um, there's a sort of discovery that happens when you make artistic creations, and there's also a sort of artistry and creativity in discovering things. Um, here's a little made-up spectrum I have of sort of things which are more, dis more creative towards the top, and I didn't know the proper word, more discoverive towards the bottom. <laughs> That word will probably not be used next week. Um, so towards the more creative side, uh, I, I, I don't know if you agree with this spectrum. Like I said, I, I'm not an expert in, uh, in arts in general, but I just sort of made this up. I said abstract visual arts and music and dance are uh, very creative. Um, things which are a little more discoverive uh, would be representational visual arts. By that, I mean things like uh, painting pictures of things which actually exist rather than sort of abstract things. Um, and drama, which is typically meant to uh, be representative of actual human interactions or at least uh, hypothetical possible human interactions. I think the purpose of these arts on some level is to reveal truths about, say, people that you are painting portraits of or things which you are representing in arts. Um, it's not just about being wildly creative and making stuff up. It's also about revealing truths about the objects which you are describing. And these are real truths in the real world. Uh, and in that sense, you, what you're doing is discovering and describing pre-existing truths, which is what I call discovery. Um, even more discover, discoverive, things like photography, documentary, films, journalism. There is artistry involved in all of these things, but they are very much about revealing and describing aspects of actual things in the real world. Uh, and then super discoverive things like the sciences, the hard sciences. But these still involve a lot of creativity, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about. Oh, or maybe I want to talk about even the most creative of these have elements of discovery. I think I already said that. Um, actually, when people talk about this, they say things like, Jimi Hendrix discovered how to play the electric guitar. Um, that's a statement, really, he was being creative. But uh, I think once your creativity reaches a certain level, it begins to seem like a discovery, because it, it seems almost obvious. You think, wow, how could it be that nobody played the guitar like that before uh, Jimmy did? Uh, Walt Whitman discovered a new way to write poetry, poetry that doesn't rhyme. How, uh, how smart do you have to be to do that, right? <laughs> Uh, in a sense, that to me feels like a discovery rather than a creation, although, of course, it was uh, immensely creative. Monumental acts of creativity can seem like discoveries. Um, for instance, the novel was created at a certain point. Uh, maybe not in a moment. It sort of developed over time, you could say. But uh, novels didn't always exist, even for a long time after written literature existed. There were not novels. But uh, that, again, that seems almost like a a thing which existed before and someone just sort of discovered how to do it. It's hard to imagine a world without novels or without rock and roll music. It's hard for me at least. Without Facebook, I don't know. Um, even music itself did not always exist and at, at a certain point in, in human history music uh, was created by somebody or by some group of people. This was an extreme act of creativity but it, uh, in a sense you might call it a discovery, right? It seems like music and things so basic uh, were always sort of bound to be created in that way. Really, it was kind of both. Uh, it, it's not meaningful at a certain level to try and draw uh, distinctions between them. So here's what I believe one of the greatest creative achievements of humanity. This is a real monument in, in human history. There's some numbers. You know how to do this? You give it the one there. Put the one there. You carry the one, that's a six. Right? You add the numbers like that. 
Um, you could probably do this in your head if you really had to. Uh, I might screw it up if I tried to do it in my head, but um, it, if you did try to do this in your head, though, I bet you would actually do it in this way. That is to say, you would imagine those numbers sort of sitting on top of each other, and then you would imagine adding them up vertically in those three positions. Um, isn't that, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? Um, what's perhaps surprising about this, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but this method for adding numbers did not always exist. Uh, certainly, it didn't exist before human beings, I guess. But even throughout human history, this method for adding numbers did not always exist. Uh, for instance, if you went back to the Roman Empire and you showed people how to do this, they would be absolutely amazed. Um, in fact, this w method was invented less than 1,500 years ago. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. And we know the name of the person who uh, came up with this. Um, actually, the, there's some debate. In, in ancient texts, you know, you can't always say for sure that the person who's labeled as the author was actually the originator of all the ideas. But um, for the most part, people say that this method is uh, done first by Al-Khwarizmi, who was, um, he was uh, in the 800s, lived in Baghdad most of his life. And he, by any measure, was probably one of the greatest uh, mathematicians and scientists um, in history. Um, most Americans don't know his name probably because he's not white. But uh, he really was uh, a huge figure. Anyway, he's best known for this book. I won't try to say the Arabic name, but the book on calculation by completed, completion and balancing. Uh, this was uh, one of the first um, books with a, with a fairly complete description of what we now call algebra. And in fact, the word um, algebra in English comes from the, the word that you can see the second to last word there, algebra. That's the, as the, uh, the um, Arabic word for this word, uh, completion, which is the process of adding the same thing to both sides of an equation. Um, that was what he called completion, and that, that word actually came to represent the whole subject. Uh, he also wrote this book, the book of addition and subtraction according to the Hindu calculation, and this is the book in which he describes how to add numbers in that way that, that we all do today, um, the Hindu and Arabic numerals. Uh, these books were translated into Latin. This is just a little historical tidbit in the 12th century. This, so this method was completely unknown in Europe until around this time, the 12th century. And they referred to it as Al-Khwarizmi's method. So if you went, to the, went around doing this and they said, oh, you must be using Al-Khwarizmi's method. That's what they called it. Or, or I'd say, as it got translated back and forth, they called it algorithms, or eventually just uh, the algorithm which eventually turned into the algorithm. This is where the word algorithm comes from. Uh, it comes from his name, Al-Khwarizmi, um, which today algorithm just means any kind of systematic process. But this was the original algorithm, um, the first and the best. Uh, to say I think this changed the world would be kind of an understatement. It changes the way that everybody thinks about uh, numbers. It makes ordinary people capable of computing in their heads things which would have been impossible otherwise. If you don't have this method, it's pretty much impossible to do that, that calculation that, that we just did, which most people would say is fairly simple. Um, you would look like some sort of a super genius if you did this to someone uh, in front of somebody who didn't know what you were doing. And in fact, you would, uh, there was concern when this eventually did come to Europe, there was actually some concern that this was some sort of black magic that people were doing because of the way in which people do this. If someone asks you to do a complicated problem like this, what you'll say is, okay, let me write this down. And what this other person will see, is they will see a person who does not know the answer and then sort of scribbles some strange looking Arabic incantations for a few seconds and then suddenly they know the answer. Uh, this is something that was totally foreign to the people of Europe and really um, uh, kind of frightening. Uh, the, the advantage, though, is not a technological advantage. It's a creative way of thinking. Um, but like I, like I said before, this is a good example of something which we feel like um, the method was, is kind of universal. And most people don't even think about the fact that that was actually invented at some point in history. Um, it was a creation of Al-Khwarizmi, but in a sense, the, it seems so obvious to us that, that it must have been something more like a discovery. 
Um, things like this have some sort of eternality to them, these sort of monumental creations, I think. All right, uh, I think they're, they're actually, if you think about it in terms of our faith, um, since God uh, allegedly knows everything, God um, probably knew about how to add numbers like this. I don't know if God really adds numbers um, at all. But um, he knew about these things. He knew about rock and roll before Chuck Berry uh, played it. Um, maybe God probably already thought of numbers in this way, or maybe there's some better way that, that we don't even know yet that um, would make our uh, ability seem foolish. But anyway, in this sense, if you think about God's role in this, all of our artistic and creative works, really, you have to think of as discoveries in that we are discovering ideas which already existed in the mind of God. That doesn't diminish our creativity. We, as individuals, are still exercising um, amazing acts of creativity and artistry. Um, I think, in a way, this is a bit like the, the sort of free will and predestination discussion, which I don't really want to get into because I think it's a sort of a theological black hole. I'm not a theologian, and people can spend your whole life talking about this. And, but the paradox itself is beautiful to me. I, I imagine myself, um, when I'm being creative, it's inspiring to me to know that God wants me to be creative, but he also already knows the objects of my creation. Um, it's a, I've heard this referred to as sort of a co-creation. I'm creating things which are also being created by God, and God is not, uh, that's not to diminish my creativity. Um, it's to, it amplifies sort of the, the, um, the relationship I have with God, I suppose. It's a privilege, I think. All right, here's where we're headed for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, beauty and creativity in mathematics. Uh, I already talked a little bit about that. Something I want to get, move on to is complexity, complexity in mathematics. And then, uh, so what? If, if you really don't care about any of this stuff, I'm going to try to convince you that you should care. Um, so about beauty and creativity, here's an example from my own research. Um, my research is in fairly uh, abstract things. This is about my lunchbox. So you have to look at the pictures for this. All right. Um, I, I have a lunch. This is actually my sandwich box that I bring to work every day. Um, this, see, the, the thing is the bread. The sandwich, this is, a, this is a Wonder Bread sandwich box, and they want you to buy Wonder Bread, I guess. Other breads are not the proper shape, right? Um, the thing, uh, it seems to have a, about the correct area, but it's too wide in this case. And the box is roughly a square, so it doesn't help to rotate the box. Um, the area should fit, but it's the wrong shape. So how should we make it fit? I'm trying to convince you that there's some creativity to solving geom geometrical problems, which this is really a geometric problem. Here's one way to make it fit. It's not terribly uh, creative. You can do better than that. This is, this is a better solution that I came up with almost immediately, I said. And this is not too hard to come up with. Cut off the end and then stick it in the top like that. Then that. That fits all right. OK, but eh, that's better. But we can do better. This is not truly creative, I don't think. Here's a creative and uh, beautiful and elegant solution. And it, and it took me, I owned this uh, sandwich box for several years before I learned to cut my sandwich in this way. So I was very uh, pleased with myself when I figured this out. Cut the thing diagonally, but the cut, if you look closely, you'll see it's not actually going from corner to corner. The cut. Um, doesn't quite hit the corners, all right? That's important, keep that in mind. Now what you're gonna do is take those two pieces and slide them along the cut like that, all right? Now the sandwich is slightly taller and slightly narrower. Hope you agree. And it fits in the box, isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I hope you agree this is, this is a creative solution, but really it is just a geometry problem that I've sort of figured out a solution to. Um, actually, all sort of new research in mathematics is of this type, uh, hard problems which require creative solutions. And, and a lot of times re mathematical research is in solving problems that you didn't believe existed before or you didn't know even that the problem existed. Like I was cutting my sandwich that earlier, uh, less elegant way for a long time. 
until it occurred to me one morning, I think there might be a better way to do this. Um, that's what mathematicians do. Um, many of the answers to the deepest questions turn out to be more complicated than we thought. I want to talk a bit about complexity. So uh, this, is, this is the last mention that I'm going to make of numbers here. These are prime numbers. That, those are the numbers which are only divisible by themselves, uh, not divisible by any lesser numbers. Um, one of the oldest and hardest things in uh, number theory, which is the area of mathematics that uh, deals with numbers, has been to describe the distribution of prime numbers. This is like a major thing that people have been thinking about for thousands of years. And uh, there's still major unsolved problems. One is called the Riemann hypothesis. And if you solve this, you get a million dollars. There's a million dollar prize for the Riemann hypothesis. There are, uh, six, uh, well, there are seven uh, million dollar problems. One of them has been solved. Um, six more, so get to work. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I want to talk about the prime numbers a little bit. I decided to make a line. So imagine all the numbers lined up. I knew that would send them away. <laughs> She told me she had to leave. So. Um, if you imagine them, the numbers all lined up, and I'm going to um, make, make a black dot for a prime number and leave a space for a non-prime number. So can you see my pointer? So this is 2, and then 3, and then 4 is white because it's not a prime number. 5 is prime, 6 is not, 7 is, 8, 9, 10 are not, 11 is, and so on, right? Uh, do you see any patterns there? No, you don't. You shouldn't, at least. If I zoom out a little bit, it looks like this. I don't know if you can still see the dots there. Um, and if you zoom out a little bit more, it looks like this. Um, you can try to look for patterns there, but uh, it's not obvious what they are. There are certain, you know, you can see some large gaps here. But even if you want to predict when the large gaps occur, it's not, uh, it's not easy at all. Um, it's hard to find any patterns. They seem almost randomly distributed. I say almost randomly because they're, they're not actually random because we can describe where they are. They are the prime numbers. That's not random. Uh, but it's, it seems like there's no pattern to them. Uh, here's, here's a little thing, though. Um, a mathematician named Ulam, one day, the story is that he was at a boring conference, and he was just sort of doodling to himself. And he decided to do the same thing, but let's uh, put the numbers in a spiral instead of in a straight line. Um, and then only indicate the prime numbers just like we did before. And because if you've done this on the line, you should not expect any patterns. He was just sort of doodling. But this is what you get if you do the dots. You see any patterns now? I'm not sure that you could say for sure that there are obvious patterns here, but depending on how good your eyes are, maybe you don't see anything. But um, it definitely doesn't look random. For instance, I can see something that looks like a diagonal line here and down here and over here too, and I seem to be diagonal lines going this way too. Um, a, a random distribution of dots wouldn't look like that at all. It would look like, it would look like nothing, right? Uh, in fact, you can, you can do a little better. In this picture, the black dots are the prime numbers. If you color the uh, non-prime numbers instead, it looks like this. Mm. Isn't that neat? Uh, so if you, put the num if you put the prime numbers in a line, it, it doesn't really look like anything. If you put them in a spiral, though, it, there's actually quite a lot of uh, complexity and patterns here that are sort of obvious to the naked eye. Um, it turns out, actually, uh, so definitely not random, the patterns that you see here, even the basic sort of diagonal line patterning, that's still not totally understood why it's true that the prime numbers line up in this way. Um, in case you wonder, there's something called conjecture F, which would explain, if conjecture F was proven, that would explain a lot about the structure of the, uh, of the uh, picture that you see there. And that's conjecture F. I don't especially know what that means, but I like the name of it. Um, a big question that, that should uh, occur to you, why should there be structure where we expect only randomness? Um, especially from the point of view of, if you think about where numbers come from, why anybody talks about numbers at all. Numbers were, were invented to serve a very specific purpose and a fairly simple purpose, just like counting things, right? But why then would there be anything complicated about them beyond just, you know, some numbers are big and some numbers are small? Why is there so much to say about them? Uh, 
it turned out to be more complicated than we thought. Uh, That's a very strange thing uh, to say about something which we created ourselves. Um, we invented them, didn't we? Uh, if we created mathematics as a human tool to solve human problems, then why should it ever have surprises in it? Why should it ever involve more complexity than we put into it? Um, that's a, that's a, a difficult question to answer. Maybe, maybe we didn't really create it. Maybe it was created apart from us somehow. You sort of get uh, sort of a feeling of intelligent design when you start thinking in this way. Um, something about mathematics, though, that, that uh, is intriguing to me or inspiring to me is that there is no scientific alternative to this feeling of intelligent design in mathematics. Um, in the natural world, in, say, biology, which is what when people talk about intelligent design, usually they're talking about evolution of the human species. There is a scientific explanation, whether you buy it or not, is a, is a question that uh, some people disagree about, but um, science provides an alternative to intelli ideas of intelligent design in nature. This is not true in mathematics, though. Mathematicians all have a feeling of intelligent design, and there is no explanation for that from science, because this is not a, a question that science can answer. Why is mathematics the way it is? Uh, science is about the physical world, and mathematics is not really part of that. Um, I like that. This kind of a mystery is, are, these mysteries are beautiful for mathematicians. I'm not saying that all mathematicians uh, believe in, in God. That's certainly not true. But all mathematicians will recognize there is unexpected complexity in the universe, and that's a beautiful thing, whether you attribute that to God or, or to nothing. Uh, that's a beautiful thing, and, and mathematicians love that. Here's one more example. Um, truth itself, it turns out truth the concept of truth is more complicated than it, than it may seem to be. Here's a fact about ordinary language. Not every statement that you can make is absolutely either true or false. For instance, Methodists are better than calcula uh, calculus? <laughs> Catholics. Um, this is not absolutely true or false because it's kind of subjective and not clear what you're talking about exactly. Better than. Uh, or, you never know when I'm hammering because I'm hammering now. This is a quote from my four-year-old daughter. <laughs> it's nonsensical, uh, not absolutely either true or false. I thought long and hard when she said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a difference between mathematics and ordinary language. Mathematical statements are either true or false. All right? This is something that students tell me all the time. That's, that, that's why I like my math class, because there's always an answer. And you know, sometimes you get the answer, sometimes you don't. But there's an answer, and every sort of every question in mathematics has an answer. And if it's true, you know, if a, if a mathematical statement is true, you can prove that it's true. And if it's false, then you can prove that it's false. And that's uh, there's a certain, you know, people like that, right? Uh, mathematical statements are always either provably true or provably false. Here's the uh, here's the surprise complexity, the twist. That is actually not true, all that, what I just said. Mathematical statements are always provably true or provably false. It's not true. In the 1930s, it was uh, discovered by Gödel that some mathematical statements are unprovable. Um, not unprovable because they're ambiguous, because they're nonsensical, but actually unprovable. And it turns out this is not just a feature of um, sort of abstract mathematics. This is a basic feature of any logical system that you could come up with. Any consistent logical system has statements which cannot be proven to be true or false. This is called Gödel's incompleteness theorem. It's one of the great achievements of uh, modern mathematics. Um, some statements cannot be proven to be true or false. There's actually uh, another option which Gödel uh, popularized. It can be true or false or what he called undecidable. That is, there's no way to tell if it's true or false. Um, and I don't just mean we can't tell because we're not smart enough because we don't know the answer yet. I mean he actually proved that there can be no answer. There can be no demonstration that certain statements are true or false. This was shocking and upsetting to people like my students who uh, just said all those things that I said. Um, there was a major unsolved problem at the time called the continuum hypothesis, and everybody was trying to prove that it was true, 
And on, on the off days, they were trying to prove that it was false. Uh, but it turns out it was uh, unprovable. And so people have stopped trying to prove it. And it doesn't even make sense now to talk about um, trying to prove the continuum hypothesis. We know that it can't be done. It is not provable. Uh, this is a little mathematical joke. I hope you all think this is funny. Paul Erdős was a famous late 20th century mathematician. He used to say, when I meet God, the first thing I'll ask him is, is the continuum hypothesis true? <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> it's funny because this is a question that I guess uh, God might know the answer to, but we cannot ever know the answer to this question because the continuum hypothesis is not uh, provably true or provably false. Strange thing. It's a strange world we live in, I guess. Some things are simply inaccessible with the tools of pure logic. Like I said, this was upsetting to mathematicians. I think this is a... Uh, this is great news to people of faith, I think, because um, I think people of faith are constantly trying to assert that certain things in the world are mysterious and unknowable. Um, and that turns out to be true, uh, mathematically speaking. And th by the way, this is what I'm saying here is not controversial. I'm not just saying this because I believe in God. This is, uh, this is the real deal. Um, it's, uh, it's inspiring to me. All right, this little photo break. Just in case you zoned out for the past 15 minutes or so, you can, I'm going to stop talking about that abstract stuff. You can start paying attention again. Uh, if, if you weren't paying attention, here's a little recap. God participates with us in creating and discovering our complex world. And there's surprising beauty and complexity at the foundations of our natural world. And, and even be, beneath the natural world, beneath the physical world, even in the nature of truth itself, there's surprising beauty and complexity. Complexity, in fact, is the norm, not the exception. Most things, when you look at them closely enough, turn out to be a lot more complicated than you thought they were. So what? Here's the, uh, the last bit here. So the big idea uh, that I want to talk about in terms of why should anybody care about any of this? God loves complexity. That's sort of my, my thesis. A God has made things complex, which might as well have been simple. For instance, uh, like I said, um, numbers are meant to serve a fairly simple purpose, they might as well have been a lot simpler than they actually are. Um, now, I'm not sure if God had any alternative in creating numbers differently than, than the way that they are, but uh, there are things which are more complex than they need to be. Uh, for instance, uh, things like our environment, like the environment of the planet that we live on, is extremely complex. Although you could, um, you could in theory, design sort of self-sufficient biospheres using far fewer ingredients than our planet has. Um, more complicated than, uh, than perhaps it needs to be. The structure of uh, physical laws, the laws of physics, uh, it, around the time of Newton, it was more or less decided that they had figured out everything there was to know about physics. And physics at that time was not terribly complicated. It involved, uh, complicated for um, ordinary people, but physicists pretty much understood everything. It turned out, though, around the beginning of the 20th century, they made all kinds of new discoveries which, which totally... Uh, change the way that we see things. And now, um, there are all kinds of things that we don't know about, about physics. Mathematics, more complex than, uh, than we expect it to be. And of course, uh, people, everybody knows that human beings are extremely complex. And um, you know, if God was, were to set out to make a race of people, did he have to make us so wild and crazy? Um, probably not, but, uh, but he did. God has made things complex, which might as well have been simple. God loves complexity. That's, that's why I come to that conclusion. And I think we should, too. Uh, this is hard, of course, because um, complexity is uncomfortable for us, I think. Complexity confuses us. Here's some uh, complex Bible verses. Um, this one from Mark. This is when the disciples were in the middle of the, the lake in a boat. Jesus uh, was on the shore, but then he walked across the lake. He came to them walking on the sea. This is the weird part. And he intended to pass by them. And then they said, hey. And then he came over and talked to them. But um, why did he intend to pass by them? That, that's confusing to me. Here's another one. Oh, this is something that, as a kid, I thought this was, this was bizarre. And then as I, as I got older, I guess I was encouraged not to think so much about this. But... Um, after Jesus performs miracles, he tells people not to tell anybody about it. Um, as a kid, I thought, that was, why did he do that? 
and then say, don't tell anybody about it. And then they immediately told everybody about it. Um, didn't you know that was going to happen? And I think, you know, if I had asked people that as a kid, probably the, the answer I got would have been, well, I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer to that question is. It's a very weird thing. And I, um, for some reason, I don't think adults often talk about that. But um, I don't think we should view these as problem verses, which, which are in need of solutions. Um, actually, I had a hard time. So th these are two verses which came to mind when I was thinking about sort of strange and confusing Bible verses. When I, I decided to do some Google searches for weird Bible verses or strange, confusing Bible verses, and every single thing I got were like blogs of people trying to tell you that Christianity is a bunch of baloney, right? Um, I feel like uh, people, Christians and uh, or believers and, and non-believers, um, are deeply unsettled by weird things. Um, I don't think that's such a, such a problem, though. I think it's okay for Christians to say, yeah, I have no idea why Jesus wanted to walk past them. I don't think that that is a concession in any way uh, of, of my, my intellectual understanding of, of God for me to say, I, I just don't know. I think that's okay. Um, the picture you get is Jesus is a complex human being with sometimes obscure motivations. I think if Jesus always did what I expected him to do, then I, I, don't, know, I don't know why I want to follow him. You know? If Jesus is just like me, only a little bit different, that, that's not what I'm interested in, really. Um, the kind of Jesus I want to follow is one which, uh, who doesn't always do what I expect him to do. You know? um, this is my favorite Bible verse, actually. I, I, um, I only say this because a few years ago, someone asked me, what's your favorite Bible verse? And at that point, I had to come up with an answer, and this, this is what I came up with. Um, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, you, if you read a little more, you, you, you can gather that the word refers to Jesus because it said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But what, what does that really mean and why is Jesus being referred to as the word? This is actually something that theologians have written about at length and which I have not read about at length. But um, what's inspiring to me is just that John chooses the opening, this is the first verse of the Gospel of John, his opening statement um, about a book which is written so that we might all believe. His opening statement is one that, on the face of it, is completely mysterious. It's not clear at all what it means. Why does he refer to Jesus as the Word? And what is that supposed to mean? What does that tell me about the identity of Jesus, that he's a Word? And really, I don't know the answer to that. It's deep and mysterious and beautiful to me. It's inspiring to me that um, when the, Bible, the authors of the Bible talk about God, they don't just say it in sort of simple platitudes, which I can immediately understand, right? If that's all the Bible was, then it, it, like I said before, that I don't want to, um, I don't want to follow a Bible that, that is just sort of telling me what I want to hear. Um, it's deep and mysterious and beautiful, and in a sense that's... Um, that's enough for me from this verse. I mean, I think you can sort of get theological and try to really unpack this, and that's, that's a worthy pursuit also. But to me, that's, that's not always necessary. I think Christians must be willing to accept complexity when we encounter it, because uh, after all, as people of faith, we care about the truth, and the truth is complex. You can't get away from that. Um, I think if Christianity is a faith based in truth, it must never become a faith of easy answers because the truth is not composed of easy answers. I suppose sometimes it is, but um, I think especially we have issues, American Christians today have become identified with simple answers and a denial of subtlety. And I think this is, uh, this is kind of a tragedy because it prevents us, you know, if you, if you think about what, what is the typical American Christian value, especially around, you know, political season like this, what do evangelicals value? Um, if someone asks, what do Christians value, I hope that the response would uh, be something along the lines of, say, the Apostles' Creed. I mean, we have historical statements of our values as a faith. Um, 
Those do not include um, seeing everything in simple terms and denying the complexity of issues. But I think we've gotten into that business uh, lately, at least. So even in our faith, I think we need to embrace complexity. Things which are confusing or strange, I think we should feel comfortable talking about things in those terms when we're discussing our faith uh, with each other. I think there's no shame in lacking answers. This is something that is well understood in science, right? Scientists are never ashamed to admit about the boundaries of their own knowledge, and I, think, um, I don't think we need to be ashamed either. Although this, is, this can be misunderstood, you know, if somebody, uh, if somebody um, comes up to me and says, hey, uh, how do you really know that um, Jesus died on the cross? I think it's bad in that situation for me to say, well, I'm, I don't know. It's a mystery. And it doesn't make any sense to me, but it's just what I know. <laughs> I don't think that's a very good answer. Um, although at a certain level, um, that is the kind of answer that, that, I, that I would provide for some questions about my faith, that there are mysteries which I don't, uh, which I don't really understand. But I think um, if we are going to pre present that idea, um, we need to kind of argue our case for complexity in, in both directions, both uh, for when we're explaining our faith to each other and also when we're trying to explain our faith to, um, to other people. It's usually not good enough in the world we live in to just say, um, I don't get it, but I still believe it. That's not really an acceptable answer, and I think we need to be careful <coughs> making uh, statements like that. Anyway, I think we have to embrace the truth, whatever it may be, um, and remember that the truth, no matter how complex it is, cannot defeat our faith. Complexity sometimes feels like a burden because it's easier to have simple ideas and you have to really change yourself to embrace complex ideas. But the truth will set us free. Um, I think if we ever feel like the truth is defeating our faith, then um, either we're misunderstanding what the truth is or we have misunderstandings about what our faith is. Uh, the truth is not the enemy of our faith. And if uh, we find complexity in truth, then um, we have to deal with it. We might as well get used to it, I guess. Here's one more verse which I think uh, applies. When I was a child, as Paul writes, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. I think, um, you know, people, um, as people who are capable, intellectually understanding complex ideas, I think we as adults are obliged to, uh, to work for it sometimes. We have to... Um, I don't think it's uh, acceptable for us to sort of turn our minds off and say, I just don't want to think about that, that's too complicated for me. Um, because uh, we're adults and we need to do away with some uh, childishness, I think. We can have faith like a child and still reason like an adult. I don't think those are uh, exclusive. I think this is what God wants from us. So here's my last words. I hope that uh, you've been able to get something out of what I've been saying. And this is my, my wish for us. Never be afraid to look more closely, turn from easy answers, ask bigger questions, embrace the unknowable, and dream deeper dreams.